<laughs> Welcome to the Oblivious Maximus podcast for episode 100. Never done a video version like this before, so apologies for seeing all the shit around my room. Um, this episode is with my very good friend, Patrick Galvin. Uh, Patty did the first episode of the old version of the podcast and has helped me out with a million things along the way. He did one of the live podcasts. He made the cover art for it. He's a fantastic graphic designer and a very good friend of mine. Uh, so it was really good to talk to him about the self-titled Rage Against the Machine record, which is what we're chatting about today. Um, yeah, this is a record that both he and I know very well. He's got a lot of different links to it than myself. Uh, so it was good to chat through it all and talk about the things we do and don't like about the band and the record and things like that too. Um, check out some of the old episodes. Obviously, this podcast started out just talking to people about music and then it's evolved into talking about records, which is what we're sort of looking into at the moment. Got a lot more coming up. Hopefully do some more video ones soon. Thanks to Jay Hart for putting this together for me and hopefully he can make this look a lot better than this GoPro standing on top of a box and this microphone in this room and we'll get there over time. So thanks for watching um, and enjoy episode 100 of the Oblivious Maximus podcast with Patty Galvin talking about the self-titled Rage Against the Machine record. Fucking brutal. All right, Patty, thank you for doing the podcast with me. No worries at all. This is... How you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm very well. Um, <laughs> Good. I can't believe i've done a hundred of them this is yeah I, it's quite impressive for I me <laughs> i was thinking the other day was i was driving to work i was just like it's kind of i was like i can't believe there's been a hundred of these but also i at the same time thought that there was more yeah but it's just like you don't want to be like i can't believe you've only done a hundred but also <laughs> it's like i can't believe that you've hit a hundred yeah anyway it's weird that it's been that it's like that's a big milestone that you've hit now which is it's cool yeah i mean certainly there was more than 100 i have recorded more than 100 i just haven't put them up but yeah that's uh that's a story for uh not being recorded and released to the world (laughs) but um not tell everybody (laughs) um but yeah no i think the other for me as well like i guess i've been doing this for like I think six years. So a hundred well, is kind of, I mean, I did, didn't do it for two years, but that's it. But we started the, we, well, we did the first one when we lived together, which was 2015, I want to say. Yeah. 14. I well, think it was th- 2000. 2000. I, yeah. It must have been 2015. Who knows? But yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is, it is very funny too, because for all intents and purposes, I'm still doing it in the exact same fashion in that I still use the same handheld recorder and I've just yeah. jimmied it up with all this other stuff now yeah, to figure exactly. it out. Exactly. Now you got a GoPro. Now it's I got a GoPro. The next logical evolution. Yeah. The next logical yeah. evolution for someone who knows absolutely nothing <laughs> to do with this stuff. Well, uh, um, you know more than me because I couldn't figure out how to get the microphone to work. So, Admittedly, I did send you my, a... And- I said this is my job yeah that's true (laughs) exactly yeah anyway um yeah anyway cool all right so you picked um the self-titled rage against the machine record why did you pick that well um yeah when you messaged me to ask me like do you want to be on it i was like oh yeah sick and so it's like all these records are kind of coming in mind and like my first thought of a record was going to be a no effects record Yep. because I love no effects. And then I was like, oh, no, no, but I don't listen to no effects that much anymore. Mm. And I was like, so maybe not that. And then I was thinking like, I listen to a lot of hip hop, like predominantly hip hop these days. And so I was like, listen. So I started going through like a Nas record or something like that, like Illmatic. And I'm like, that'd be great. But also like Nas, like Illmatic is probably my all time favorite record, but I still skip songs on that record. Like it's kind of, right. I don't love everything and so i was like thinking about that i was sitting i was at dinner with alex alex young our friend yeah and um and yeah i was was talking about it and then i just realized that it's like i got to no effects like liking them and i got to nas both via rage against the machine okay and so i was just like it makes so much more sense because they're the band that i've liked of all bands that i still like i've liked them the longest yeah like i got into them quite young and they sort of informed my taste in music in various directions. And yeah. so I was like, well, that makes sense. And this record in particular is probably, I'd say it's probably the record I've listened to the most in my life. Like, 
Yeah, I, I, it's really funny for me with with Rage Against the Machine. I think a big thing that I always forget is that they only have three of their own records, which yeah, are, exactly for for a band of their tenure and also their like size, you would assume mm. that they had like ten records or something. You know, well that's the thing. Yeah, it's kind of like they they're like they're a legacy band. They're a band that is on like. You know, obviously stylistically different, but on the same level as like Metallica and shit like that, they yeah. are a band that will be remembered forever. And they've got three records and then ended on a covers record. It's yeah. like, which it's it's real weird. Which has like great songs on it. Like it's got great oh, covers, yeah. but like it is. Yeah, it's bizarre that that's where it sort of flattened for. It's them. just like because like I like they're a band like even though I've chosen the first record, I think they're a band that got better with each release mm. and like where they were as a band, like collectively, like as like musicians and like ideals and everything that they were doing when they did the covers record, that was like their peak. Like they were fantastic Yeah, yeah. and they didn't do anything original and then ended. And it's like, Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's a bummer. I mean, yeah, I think it's, it's cool listening to this record though, because like, I suppose, you know, I first heard this record in high school, like year seven, I, I yeah. assume like most people did. Um, yeah. and the thing for me with this in it, like, I guess in hindsight is that like the music, while it is like very palatable by a kid in year seven, particularly if you've yeah. been listening to new metal or you've been listening to rap or whatever, it obviously yeah, yeah. brings, it's part of that whole thing. Um, exactly. But I think that the thing that always jars me about it when I listen to it now is like, there's no way when I was in year seven did I understand any of what they were talking about. <laughs> well, that's that's the kind of thing. It's like, I think, because I would have, like, first started listening to this band, like, pre-high school. Like, when I... I would have heard them on Triple J when I was, like... I remember discovering Triple J when I was in, like, year four or five. Yeah. Because I had, like... My best friends had older siblings who were like, check this out. But, yeah. um... And I, remember, I would have heard, like, Killing the Name on the radio or something like that or some sure. other song off this record because i remember specifically hearing this record as a kid and listen and being like this is great and listening to it and not realizing that they had other records yeah because yeah. i was a kid and just assumed that this was it yeah and um and so but i like it's like i don't know i think it just like it is quite yeah palatable like you were saying and it, it's like Something that was funny, I was like the other day I was listening, I was trying to do some research about the record because like I, years ago, like I kind of go in and out of like phases of like how into this, like I, I've always, I always like them, mm. but I, every few years or so, I just get like really fucking in depth and just listen to nothing but Raging Against the Machine. Yeah. And so I have, I like, I would had some kind of facts in the back of my head and shit like that about this record, but I was like, I'm going to brush up and listen to things. And I found this interview with Tom Morello from fucking 1993 it was when they this album had just come out they were doing Lollapalooza and some uh, the interviewer described Rage Against the Machine as public enemy for white kids <laughs> <laughs> and and I thought that was very funny but he's also like Tom Morello's like no 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 we're not that like he's like you know there's obviously like similarities and stuff but then he starts to explain he's like yeah but we are clearly playing music that's more it's easier to listen to for like for suburban white kids and just you know general audiences than public enemy because public enemy is you know rap is obviously I mean, rap is a very big genre but it's it is niche yeah and so especially and particularly public at enemy. the time as and the, at the time yeah. as well exactly but so rage against machine we're clearly just taking the same kind of the same messages that um well not the same but most of the same messages that um public enemy were doing and like you know the same ideals and same kind of vibe mm. but then just put it into like fucking funk rock yeah and yeah and it, but then that's how it kind of like it translated so there are kids like us who when we were like you know children hearing this and being like this is great and not really getting the the depth of it or you know yeah what the band was actually about but it's still appealed to us in some way and yeah. i guess that was kind of what they were trying to do is that they were trying to they they had a message and they were trying to code it in something that worked for everybody yeah and i think i think the other thing too that's interesting is like Obviously, I didn't know this when I was a kid and liked Rage Against the Machine a lot, you know, in school. But, like, yeah, growing up and then going into playing in hardcore bands and stuff, then learning that, um, you know, Zach was in, you know, a relatively influential hardcore band 
and exactly yeah yeah and like uh and when you when you look into doing you know similar doing like research about it as far as it basically shows is that like he he was getting more into the message of what he was doing and getting more mm. into hip hop and other styles of music and i guess wanted in uh, wanted inside out the band he was in to do that and then yeah, yeah. then just was like i guess the rest of them didn't want to do it or whatever and <laughs> Their record that they didn't put out was meant to be called Rage Against the Machine. <laughs> I, I was going to say, yeah, it's like, it seems like this is kind of the direction that band was going in, not necessarily musically, but like everything else was heading this direction. Yeah. And so it's just the next But it, And it's just very funny that they didn't do that. And uh, I, I, again, I'm sure people out there can school me on this, but I have no idea what those other people did. But then yeah. he goes and does this and ends up being in like one of the biggest bands in the 90s <laughs> like, well that's what's funny it's like because like the, the the story that i heard is that one of the guys in the band because as was the style at the time decided to be a Hare krishna yes. and so left the band and so the rest of them were like we don't know what the fuck to do so we'll just break up and it's just funny that that like rather than just being like okay well let's just keep going without that guy or you know figure something out they just stopped and then yeah one of the biggest bands in history kicks <laughs> off comes, comes out of it yeah well yeah I mean, I think there's, like, right off the bat, there's, I have so many, like, stories tied in with this record, but, like, I mean, one of the first things is that Bomb Track is, like, one of the first songs that guitar teachers teach people. Yeah, right. <laughs> because yeah. it's just, like, a scale box. Like, it's... Yeah. And I, I remember, like, when I did my first guitar lessons, my teacher going, like, what do you listen to? And I'd be, you know, mm. corn, this, that, whatever. And he'd be yeah. like, I can't teach you how to play that on an acoustic guitar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. but I can teach you bomb track by Rage Against Machine. And I was like, oh, yeah. perfect. I love new metal. Well, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what's so funny about like, well, there's two things. Like it makes sense that I like that Tom Morello used to be a guitar teacher and then everything on this record is just like stuff yeah. that's, that works for guitar teachers. So it's like, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, was, I was talking to Ellie for, you know, listeners, my partner, Ellie. Um, uh, I was talking to her about this this morning about how, like, yeah, like you talking about new metal is that this is basically like, it's, it's rap rock in the way mm. that new metal is effectively rap rock, but it's, it's not, it's kind of, it's. Well, and, and I think the, the term rap rock doesn't really make sense in, in reference to new metal often because yeah. it isn't rock music it is like obnoxious yeah. metal like it it's yeah, like yeah. and it, it takes far more influence from pantera fear factory like all that stuff yeah, and i mean yeah, obviously yeah. fear factory end up just becoming a new metal band anyway but like yeah 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 those things shape it a lot more whereas this is actually like rock music like the the riffs That's in it. this are, are more and I mean, there's a song on this, which is just a Led Zeppelin riff, but like it, they are yeah. far more Zeppelin than they are metal, you know? Well, that's it. Like the, cause like, yeah, I, I listened to some other thing the other day where it was like this, like music nerd guy just breaking down the musicianship of the record mm. and he's just talking about it. And he's like, yeah. And he's like, this riff comes from a funk band and this riff comes yeah. from fucking, yeah. From Led Zeppelin. And this comes from here. And it's like all influenced from like, I guess what you would describe as traditional rock and roll kind of stuff. Yeah. And but it's, but they, but I guess because of the, I don't know, the anger behind it and kind of the, the more, the, it has a bit more of a, um, I don't know, verocity to it. It's, it, it leans closer to the metal side of things, even sure. though musically it's not. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, and I mean, having a song yeah. that says fuck a million times, exactly, obviously yeah. it, it, help, aids in that. <laughs> like Exactly. It's like, there's the, there's the whole conversation where everyone like talks about Parkway Drive and they're like, Parkway Drive are a hardcore band. And like musically, they're not a fucking hardcore band, yeah. but their attitude and the, the, the way that that band works is a hardcore band. Yeah. And it's like this, this, like, like that. And I think that's why, like when I said before, I got to know effects from this because you listen to this record and it is like the songs are kind of like, they feel like punk songs. Like they, mm. it has the kind of the, the same feel of like having like this fucking gang vocals and shit like that on it. It's like, yeah. it, 
it has that feeling of like punk and hardcore and metal, but the riffs aren't any of those things. <laughs> no, yeah. And like, and certainly the fact that, well, I mean, you know, for all intents and purposes, he's rapping, but he yeah. does, he does scream still on like pretty much yeah. every song. And like, there'll exactly, be, a, yeah. there's like a yelling part in every song and stuff like that. Like, yeah. Um, and even the songs that are like straight up like funk bass and drums with rapping and Tom Morello just making noises still yeah, yeah. always end up having like a big riff or having a screaming part or a fast part or something you know exactly like they they are they kind of evolve in the same way as as punk and hardcore songs do and i yeah. guess like even in the 90s as well when you know rage were kicking off all the bands that were influenced like the hardcore bands that were influenced by like inside out and whatnot all started like there's been it's like fucking um glass drawer is a bad example but like bands that popped up in the 90s that all started to like it was like pre new metal but they all started influence like had that kind of rapping kind of influence in like the way yeah i don't know the way that the vocals worked and shit like that they weren't necessarily rapping but everything was kind of going that way rage against the machine it was kind of rage were doing it as well it's like i think it was just the 90s was yeah. heading that way musically in the alternative music space. Well, and, and so and, that's why they did. And there's interesting stuff with that too, because then there's the other side, which obviously Rage are very connected with, but like Cypress Hill as well, who started going the other direction, who when yeah. Cypress Hill started, they were just, you know, like pure hip hop. And then Cypress Hill would you like, <laughs> then- there's, I mean, there's a story about Cypress Hill, how they, I guess got offered a maybe it was even like Woodstock or Lollapalooza or one of those things, and they got offered the the, yeah, yeah. the show. And the dude who like managed them was like, "Why didn't you play with a band?" And they were like, "Oh no, hip hop acts like don't have bands." And they yeah, were like, yeah. and he was like, "Well, you could have a band. Like you you know people who play music, you could do it." And again, as I've been doing on this podcast, just saying things and assuming they're true. But like as far <laughs> as I as far as I remember. In the 90s, it was, like, Cypress Hill were one of the first, like, big hip-hop groups that had had big records and had big singles and stuff that just kind of out of the blue started touring with, like, a 10-piece band with, like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the DJ and them were always there, but then they were like, oh, we got a drummer, we got a keyboard player, we got a guitar player, we got a bass Mm. player. And then that, over time, becomes, like, the norm. And then, you know, even, like every time you know any all those bands now snoop dogg like he tours with a full well, band you know like exactly yeah yeah and i think to to uh cypress hill's detriment they also then ended up doing that what was it, skull and bones or whatever like they, they took it a bit too far but um but you know, would... yeah like that was it like listening to old interviews with tom morello and shit like that where he's just talking about how like yeah i think one of their first ever tours pre this album maybe even was with Cypress Hill and so they kind of that's where they made that connection and kept doing stuff together and they were clearly like Rage started doing things to be a bit more like Cypress Hill and Cypress Hill started doing things to be a bit more like Rage yeah and so it kind of off it went but um yeah it's like yeah I think the point I was I was getting at before is that it's just funny because it's like on paper it is rap rock yeah and on paper it shouldn't work and on paper i should fucking hate this band (laughs) but i don't i love this band so much yeah well it's just it's it's kind of funny how it works i think there's aspects of it too that really i mean that have aged well in that Mm. i mean i think the thing now that i guess he's like getting better recognition for it but i feel like there was never it was never the case like he, like, Zach is, a, uh, to to my credit, and again, I'm not a aficionado of rap or anything, but, like, he's quite <laughs> yeah. a good MC in that, the scope of well, what he does. It. And yeah, particularly particularly the way he conveys the message that he has is very, yeah. cl- is very good and very concise and very clear. And then I think, like, I mean, I was, like all white people, love Run the Jewels. <laughs> and yeah. He, his, like, that guest spot on, you know, the second Run the Jewels record or whatever Mm. is fucking awesome. And then when they posted a photo of him that he was going to be on their new record, I was like, oh, fuck yeah. Like, I got so revved up by it. And 
the part on the new record is fucking awesome. Like it's even I better. I think. Even listen to it yet, but but that's it, like that's the thing. When he has paired up, like because he did like I remember there was yeah, there was like rumors for fucking ever that he was going to release a solo record, and then he did that. Like this would have been. 10, 15 years ago, he did that song with DJ Shadow, that uh, yeah. March of Death or whatever it's called, and it fucking rules. And it, but it's like, whenever he's done just like straight hip hop, yeah. it just shows it's like, oh yeah, you know, you're a very good MC. Like it's not, it's not like you work in this one specific space. Like you as a, as a vocalist and as a as a yeah as a, a rapper, he's very fucking good. Yeah. And so when he does pop up, and like I kind of like the fact that it, he isn't just everywhere. Like I feel like. You know, I love this band, but I think Tom Morello needs to fuck off a little bit. And um, <laughs> well, that, that's like <laughs> that's one of my that's one of my notes as well. Is that like I think one of the the bigger one of the bigger detriments to this band, and like again, I don't know him. He could be a very nice person, but yeah. like the aura around Tom Morello is such that yeah. like like when I talked about like Green Day, for example, um, or talking about Danzig or talking like lots of these bands where like and you two and things like that like for all the good the band does it often gets yeah. overshadowed by <laughs> one member doing one thing that's like pretty lame <laughs> and then it yeah yeah then everyone's like oh fuck that band because of whatever lame thing yeah. he did you know well that's the thing it's like I, my memory is so bad that I just forget everything and so I just have this like sour taste in my mouth mouth for uh, about Tom Morello, but I can't, I can't tell if it's just because I hated Audio Slave so much, or if <laughs> he actually said or did something that angered me. I have no idea. But I just, anytime I think of him, I'm just like, Bleh. it's just like, even though he's done, he's he's contributed to some of the best things I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, and he's like, he like heavily contributed to. He wrote fucking everything. Um, yeah, but it's like I don't know. It's just like when we were both working at a music festival the other year that mm. he was at yes and i don't know why i was like i was trying to like linger around to see him and then when i saw him i was kind of just like fuck that guy i'm not going near him <laughs> and like i don't know why i just like I, I can't remember if he did something that i disagree with or if i just don't like what he's doing these days well my my only real well i mean my i had i remember when i was younger i had big beef because guitar world magazine did this like triple fold cover that had like the best guitar players of you know modern music or whatever like from the 60s yeah. until now and it was like yeah you know tony Iommi from black sabbath jimmy page from led zeppelin all the way through to like zach wild and you know guitar right. yeah, guitar yeah. shit or whatever right yeah yeah he was on the cover as one of like the best <laughs> guitar players of all time which Again, yeah, that's okay. a that's a separate thing, but I remember <laughs> yeah. myself and most of the metal community, Dimebag Daryl wasn't there, and yeah, of yeah. course, yeah. arguably a far better guitar player. Like, doesn't matter right, what yeah, his contribution yeah. is, even though Pantera are one of the biggest metal bands of all time, he wasn't on the cover, but Tom Morello mm. was, and for everything that Tom Morello has written, and it's been really good in terms of like guitar playing. Half of the songs for Rage Against the Machine are him fucking around with his pickups. Like, it's, you know, it's not <laughs> yeah, guitar yeah. playing. <laughs> but but it's, that's what's... Like, he's more palatable. It's like, it's the it's the public enemy for white kids thing again. It's just yeah, like, yeah. he is... Yeah, he's more like... Dimebag Daryl looks like he's... A, well, it doesn't look like he was a fucking redneck. And so people well, didn't want him on the cover of things, but you do want Tom Morello. And in hindsight... He probably would have rocked up with a fucking Confederate flag guitar. <laughs> so it's probably yeah, exactly. probably better than they didn't put him on the cover anyway. Um, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But like, I mean, the other thing too with that is that, um, you know, and I guess while it is a lot of guitar players and even, you know, myself hang shit on it at the same time, like all the weird fucking wild stuff that he does on guitar makes this band so it like well, that's it, it. Yeah. it's perfect for what it's doing um and that's it like if if you just talk about it, you're like yeah he's just fucking around and, like taking the fucking lead out and hitting the strings with it and it's like you mm. what are you doing man but it works like it yeah it like the the parts that stick in your head in rage songs a lot of the time are fucking weird things that aren't riffs or anything it's just yeah. noises that he's making but it works one of the things that really got me recently with that was 
you know how those masterclass ads always come up on yeah, Facebook? Yeah, yeah. And there was yeah. like a masterclass, like Tom Morello teaches guitar, and in in the like <laughs> in the like trailer, there's a bit of him like, you know, like fucking around with his pick and like maybe he's got like a screwdriver or something, and it's like, yeah. <laughs> and it's just like, who? Why did they give him a masterclass? Like, who's, like <laughs> what kid are you going like? All right. You've got a guitar. Perfect. Go get a <laughs> screwdriver. Jam it in the fucking yeah. thing. <laughs> like- All this makes me think of is I remember years and years ago, like 10 years ago or so, you went to some noise show in Canberra. This would have been before you moved to Melbourne. You went to some noise show with like Sam and Murph or something like that. And I didn't go. And I was like, I saw you afterwards. I'm like, what was the show like? And you're like, there was a guy who put his guitar on the ground and started sweeping it with a broom. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, cool. <laughs> Like, that sounds like the worst fucking thing in the world. And that is just, like, the evolution of what Tom Morello started doing. <laughs> the only good thing that came out of going to that noise show was when we played that show in Adelaide at Animal House with Phantoms and Jake was wearing a Grim Reaper outfit and had a broom <laughs> and kept banging it onto my hand and kept yelling sweep picking at me while he was doing it. <laughs> Oh, so going to that show had a benefits years yeah. down the track. Yeah, yeah, made a great <laughs> bit later on. Yeah, but uh, um, <laughs> so you've but, seen uh, yeah. you've seen Rage Against the Machine like a few times, right? No, just once. So I saw them when they did like the big reunion. Yeah, whenever that was, 2010 or something, and they I think they came out and did Big Day Out, but they did a side show, and I went to the side show. Which, like, Sideshow was in a fucking arena. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I saw that. And that was, like, yeah, I've kind of had these, yeah, like I was saying, I had these kind of dips. And I think that happened when I was kind of just, like, oh, yeah, I like, I, I've loved Rage Against the Machine for most of my life. I'll never get a chance to see them again. I should go to this. But I wasn't, like, losing my mind being, like, holy shit. And then I went and I was, and it was amazing. Like, they, even yeah. though I was, like, hundreds of meters away, up sitting in a seat next to a bunch of fucking losers it was amazing like it was a fantastic show and like because like growing up as a kid i would watch like any live video that i could find back when it was i guess like early dvd or whatever the fuck things online i would watch live things of this band and it was always so sick and so i was kind of just like yeah now it's you know the reunion that they always said they never would do and all this shit and then i'm like oh no that that fucking ruled that was great yeah so yeah, like well, they're a band, and like because they were supposed to do a reunion now or something. Yeah, like this year. Yeah, I think. yeah. Well, and, and um, th- that's that's one of the things that I reckon I'm like most bummed about in terms of stuff that like, I mean, I, I definitely didn't buy a ticket, but I was I was definitely going to, and and partially because Run the Jewels were the support, and yeah, I I love them, and I wanted to see them, and knowing that he sang on the record, I was like great he's gonna go out and do the two songs with them like that's fucking awesome exactly, yeah. like yeah and i i've and seen videos of him getting out him doing the guest spots with them and it's like for you know which i guess is wild to think about because uh, you know this band again they've won two grammys which i completely forgot mm. i and yeah didn't even clock that yeah this record itself is has is triple platinum in America yep. and it's sold yep. over 5 million copies worldwide. So like, I mean, it's a yeah. huge record, obviously, yeah. but yeah, yeah, yeah. in the scope of like rage, in the scope of liking this band to me, they're still like, Oh, only metal guys like them. Only, only people from yeah. school like them or whatever, but that's not true. And no. <laughs> like, and watching yeah. like watching him come out on stage with run the jewels, the couple videos I've seen of that, People lose their fucking mind when he comes out on stage and he's wearing like, looking like Che Guevara in a fucking bad brain shirt. And people are like, yeah. holy shit. <laughs> like, that's, that's, that's what's so funny is like, and I guess this, there's a, a weird like elitism that comes with growing up in the punk and hardcore scene. But yeah. Like I, I was obviously growing up in that community, but also listening to Rage, which I found before it, but always having this feeling kind of just being like, I understand this band, this band better than everybody. Like I get where it comes from. I get what they're doing. And then going to see them in front of, you know, thousands and thousands of people. And then just being kind of like, yeah, 
I, I know that there are big bands. Obviously, like, you, back when Academy was a nightclub in Canberra, you could go there and they would play Killing in the Name because <laughs> yeah. that's the one song that that crowd knew. But And you can do the volume like, drop. Yeah, it's all exactly. About the volume and so drop. it's like, <laughs> yeah. And so, like, you know, they're clearly a very widely loved band, but being there and just being like, this is so weird because in, my, in like my heart, I'm like, they're a hardcore band. Yeah. They're a hardcore band with rapping. Yeah. And so it's, yeah, it was kind of like a, it's a it's a weird thing because it feels like it should be much more niche and smaller than it is. Yeah. Well, and then, I, I mean, I think that's interesting in the scope of this record too because this record, I mean, really this record only has one, like, hit on it in well, Killing of the Dead. But yeah. to that as well, Perfect Link for us to talk about, but... One of the songs on this is in The Matrix, which is yes. one of <laughs> yes. the best things that happened to my life. Um, yes. But, and again, like, I don't know why I've never noticed this. I guess because it just plays over the end credits. But I was like, oh, the whole song's about coming to reality and realizing the- it's called <laughs> yeah. Wake Up. I, literally, when yeah. I was walking Mabel the other day, I was like, that's why they put it in the movie. Like, yeah, I don't know yeah, how exactly. it's taken me. Like, one of my favorite movies, a song I've loved yeah. since I was in school. The other day, I was like, oh, it's all, it all makes well, that, sense now. That was it. Because, like, I went through, like, a big phase when I was, like, you know, 12, 13, where I was fucking obsessed with The Matrix when it just came out. Like, I came out when I was 11 or 12. Yeah. And I remember seeing it at the cinema and... But, like, I, I already loved Rage Against the Machine at that point. And I remember... I went and saw The Matrix with my nana... Because, right. funny story that I popped into my... I watched The Matrix the other week, and I remembered that, for some reason, seeing the trailer for that movie, I thought it was a vampire film before I went and saw it. I that's, don't that's know not, what... Well, yeah. black coats, green faces, yeah. <laughs> like... And maybe, because, like, I guess Blade would have come out beforehand, but I didn't see Blade, but I was just like, hey, it's a vampire movie. And that's so, what they look like, um, Blade. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And so I went to see it and it was like, oh, this is not what I was expecting at all. But then it ends with a Rage Against the Machine song, who would have been my favorite band at the time. And I was like, this movie fucking rules. It's got everything I like in it. Yeah. And so then I was just like, yeah. And then like, you know, Matrix Reloaded, they obviously use Calm Like a Bomb and the credits in that. And it's just like, oh yeah. And it's like, I guess because this is like, I wrote some points of things to talk about in this. The, well, one of the things why this band has survived with me for so long is that, like, they helped kind of inform some of my, like, early kind of political ideas and thinking. Yeah. Like, personal politics. And as I've gotten older, they've kind of just stayed with me. And it's like, I, I get more out of the lyrics and the stories around what the band did. Because they weren't just a band. Like, they obviously, you know, they were quite involved in... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. ...in, like, local politics and, you know, US politics and everything like that. And, um... Yeah, and so, like, as I've gotten older and kind of my, I guess my, my, I keep saying politics, but, you know, my ideas and everything like that, my beliefs have strengthened and solidified, then I can listen to Raging Against the Machine. I'm like, yeah, and it all still works and everything kind of, it's still, they've stuck with me in that way. And I think that's probably why I loved The Matrix as a kid so much as well. Because, like, I, you know, my my parents were very, like, politically active since yeah. before I was born and as I was young. So I've always had kind of this influence and then seeing, like, finding this band that speaks to me in that way, and I'm like, fuck yes, and then finding this movie that speaks to these ideas of not trusting anyone and working with this band, it all just, yeah, it was just like perfect storm for a 12-year-old. Well, that I mean, that was one of the things I was going to ask is that obviously a lot of, I mean, I think probably your parents, your parents were like some of the first people I met that I knew as like people's parents who were like still very well particularly your dad still very like firm in his beliefs and still very rooted in in uh you know things that he'd been you know actively pursuing since he was a young man well that's it like because like there's like the 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 photos which like Obviously, people listening to this can't say, but you know, the, there's the photo of my dad when he was getting arrested and he's wrapped in chains and shit like that. And that photo was taken when he was 21. Yeah. And like, that was that was kind of like midway of his like activism career kind of thing. It wasn't yeah. early on. It was, And so it's like, he was doing this shit when he was very young. Mm. And then it was kind of like, so I guess like then growing up and listening to this, I was just like, oh yeah, like 
it, it kind of, I it, it made me feel better about having like you know about I guess like maybe more comfortable rather with being, I guess politically active and vocal about things, and yeah. liking bands like Rage Against the Machine and seeking out more music like this because yeah. I guess my parents started doing it so young as well. Yeah, well, and I guess that's a good way. To, that's a I mean, it's a good way to link link in with what they are. Well, the, the way that they're feeling and the things that they think about as well and connecting with their yeah. ideals in a certain way. Yeah. And it's, it's something that's funny as well. Is I remember I remember reading about this years ago and then in reading stuff this week, I, I kind of popped up again, that a big thing around this record in particular that Raging Against the Machine were really like vocal on. Like, you know, these days there's a lot of bands talking about Spotify and just being like, you know, Spotify doesn't pay artists enough and that's kind of a big point. The big point of contention for, I guess, alternative music and like, music like Rage Against the Machine when this record came out was that parent there were like parental committees and shit like that and politicians going against it being like kids sh- shouldn't be listening to this band because they say fuck too many times and yeah, it's like yeah. it's putting bad ideas in kids heads and so there was this whole like apparently Tom Morello was like heavily involved in um making record stores sell records to kids even if they had the explicit sticker on them mm-hmm. and he's just like kids need to hear this kind of shit and it's like, I kind of, you don't really think about it these days because there's the internet and anyone can get basically anything they want. But it's like, because there's nothing really, like, you know, Spotify might have explicit next to a song, but there's nothing stopping a, a six-year-old no. putting that song on. Like, but back then it was like, it was actually hard for kids to, to get some of this music. But that was a big thing is when I found this band and I remember playing it at home and my parents would be like, who's this band? And then I would show them the CD, which had like, because the 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 liner note, like the liner notes for this record, just has like, you know, it will obviously look at the lyrics, but also they had like things in there that were very and like the fucking cover itself is the photo of the burning yeah. monk, like, yeah. And so it's like my parents saw this and were like, yes, more like this. <laughs> Keep finding bands like this. This <laughs> and, is what we want you to do. Was, exactly. Yeah. So they like they they really like nurtured that and encouraged it, and I guess that's probably what led me to find like punk music and stuff like that. But yeah. um But yeah. It's funny that they, that back then it was a really like it was a real point of contention. Especially, it is funny though that like they were on a major label, so therefore like I've worked in the music industry and I know how fucking singles work and how they're chosen and how everything needs to be it needs to hit certain markers. And the, this major label that put out this record picked the song that has fuck in it like two hundred times. Like yeah, it's it's very funny that that's the single off this record. Yeah, well, and, like, I know that there is an edited version of it, but, like, yeah. the version that everyone knows is the fuck you version. No one... Exactly, I don't, yeah. I don't know that I've ever heard the version without that, you know, like... Yeah, I, that's it. I was listening to a thing the other day, and it was, like, it was a, I would listen to, like, a snippet from, like, a BBC radio show, and they were just like, okay, now we're going to play the... Like, we're going to play Killing in the Name, but we have to play the censored version because this is the radio. And so they played the censored version. I'm like, this is fucking terrible. Yeah, like, what is... It's that's, so, that's half of the song. <laughs> like, exactly. Like, just so much of the song is just... <laughs> and it's like... Oh, God. Why, why would anyone listen to this? <laughs> I mean, I think... But, um... I think, uh, like a huge part of um, liking this band for me too has been that it, it is one of those things that um, it, the the message in it has not really wavered. Like it's still... That's it, yeah. It's still relevant. I mean, I think even something that as recent as like, you know, a couple months ago, like when all the George Floyd stuff happened in America... The fucking next yeah. day or the next week or whatever it was when the AFL started back up here, which has been a yeah. big part of my Twitter presence at the moment, is there is definitely yeah. an incognito emo working at Channel 7 footy <laughs> who yes. is putting on new metal and breakdowns and hardcore and stuff coming out of ad breaks the week yeah, yeah. after that all happened and all the black lives matter protests and stuff started happening yeah. after coming out of an ad break in the footy they had the like the verse part of this song not the fuck you part but yeah, you know the yeah. bit that's talking that's about cops exactly <laughs> like that, yeah yeah exactly. and like i'm sure no one at channel 7 was like paying attention but they got that dude whoever that is that woman that that person got that on normal tv 
Yeah, and yeah. footy is being watched at the moment by more people than ever because they can't go to the games. And I was like, yeah. who's this fucking emo genius putting <laughs> the yeah. fuck cops part yeah. of the Rage song on normal TV? Yeah. <laughs> like, that's, that's fantastic. But that's, that's something I always found so funny about that song is that it's like, it, it, it ended up like, you know, I guess in like the, in the public consciousness, it became like a song that is like the anthem for like being mad at your parents kind of thing. It's yeah. like, that's what I interpreted it as. Yeah. That's what it is. But the song is not about that. And so then like hearing it in public spaces, like I mentioned Academy before, like hearing it yeah. at a nightclub and it's like, this is a song about, yeah, like this is, this song is about something that none of you are like you singing along. That's not what you're it's not what you think it is. And it's, it's not a, it's your, funny it's that not it's your experience like, at all either. <laughs> yeah. You know? Well, that's it. Exactly. Exactly right. And it's just, it's like, it's just funny how that, and I guess that was kind of the point. I, the thing that I was reading is, yeah, they were on a major label and the whole point of them apparently signing to a major because, you know, yeah, I like the vibe of this band should be the same as like a punk and a hardcore band. They should be independent, but mm. they wanted to be on a major label because they were like, well, we have a message that we want to get as far and wide as possible. And it's like they effectively, yeah, in the early 90s, after NWA snuck a fucking fuck cop song <laughs> into the public consciousness. Yeah. And it's just very funny. But, you know, they're not, they're not black guys, so they don't get as much grief about it as uh, NWA did. Yeah. But, um, well, I mean, but, yeah, it's, 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 it is wild. To th- I mean, and for sure, the other thing too is like another thing that I had about that song in particular is that like, I played that song at a year nine social and yeah. we didn't get in trouble. And I still, to this day, have no idea how we didn't get in trouble for playing a fucking disco and saying, fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. And everyone knew it. And it was like, because yeah. it was a had a hip hop part or whatever. Like, I don't that's know how it. we got it's away like, with that. <laughs> like, it's That's something I find... Like, I, I, there was a point, and this is like probably why I also wanted to talk about No Effects. There was a point in year nine where I got, um, I got in trouble because I played their song Murder the Government at an assembly. And, um, because I thought it'd be funny. And, you know, I got in trouble for that because they're singing Murder the Government. But yeah. then, yeah, the same thing. Like, school bands would play Rage Against the Machine covers, and, like, you know, you could, it was just around, and you could wear Rage Against the Machine shirts to school, and it was fine. And yeah. it was kind of like, which also is funny, like the fact like this is, and this, I guess this popped up recently as well, where there were a bunch of like, you know, right wing losers who would like Tom Morello posted shit about Trump and they're like, well, I'm not supporting your band anymore. Cause you, you're getting all political. I'm like <laughs> one, you're a fucking idiot, but two, the name, like yeah. the name of the band. And that's what like back then teachers like would see rage against the machine and be like, Oh, fun. And it's like not it's 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 in the fucking name what this band is about. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't the the other thing too is like it's I mean, you know, I don't talk about it that much on this bike, maybe I do, but like I've worked in education now for mm. four, 15 years now, 14 years. And I mean, I'm a obviously a proponent of the dumb cunt arts so like (laughs) for me for me like (laughs) doing this stuff and i mean i i am a i'm an i'm an adult now who makes decisions i'm a complete advocate for people talking to children like they are like they should be respected and also not hiding things from them i mean one of the things that bums me out the most about my work is that I often have to make sure that kids don't listen to swearing and kids, you know, get told off when they swear, which I understand in terms of a respect level, I understand yeah, teaching yeah. teaching that to people. But at the same right. time, like, you know, like, like you mentioned before, like, I, I mean, I remember not being able to buy CDs because they had a thing on it that said you couldn't buy them. Yeah. Like, I'm, I, I remember, I mean, it's a, it's a funny one now in the terms of the, what I've done as in bands, but like I couldn't buy cunt by blood duster and well, yeah, you know, like that's, and, that's a bit of a step up, I think, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like, and uh, I remember not being able to buy cannibal corpse records because of the cover art yeah, yeah, and yeah. things like that, which is funny. Was now this a, and, like, was this your, 
Was this your mum not wanting you to, or like? No, no. I remember like not you couldn't it. buy them. Like you couldn't buy yeah, it right, yeah, from yeah. Sanity or uh, you know HMV or whatever it was. You know those shops. Yeah, you yeah. couldn't buy it unless yep. you were sixteen or something. <laughs> and like, it's like I, re- I like the idea that the, the CD is sitting on the shelf and you can see it and they're like yeah you can look at it but you're not allowed to take it home and look at it unless you're 16 yeah well <laughs> so- and I remember the the with Cunt for example was like it just had a black cover on it that said Blood Duster and it was in the corn font <laughs> and <laughs> at least as far as my memory goes I could be proven yeah, wrong yeah. about that but like, I remember not being able to buy it, and the reason was because it was called Cunt, and I knew what it was called, but they're like, no, you yeah, can't yeah. buy that. And I was like, well, okay. And then, so, I, I don't know how I got it, but, I mean, similarly, like, I don't know how I got those Cannibal Corpse records, but it's, it's just funny now that, like you said, like, with the internet, you can literally just write in Blood Duster Cunt on Google, and it comes up, or... Yeah. And, you know, and, and it's just strange that there is, like, there was a time in history where a person like Tom Morello had to, like, and even more, even further back, like, obviously fucking Twisted well, yeah. Sister and all those bands had to, like, take yeah. people to court and be like, anyone should be able to listen to this. It's just music. Like... Well, and that's the whole thing. It was, like, with, like, Kiss and shit like that. It's mm. like, you know, there were, there were fucking, there were parents groups and there were everything against Kiss because they looked satanic because they wore face paint and you listen yeah. to that music now and they're playing fucking disco at one point like it's like <laughs> yeah it doesn't nights, matter, in, but it's nights like, yeah. in satan's service playing <laughs> yeah, playing yeah. disco yeah but it's like yeah like there's like bands forever have had to fight this kind of thing i back what you're saying about the guy just being like you know that the album's called cunt you want to buy this album called cunt the guy will just be like i'm not selling you this album even though you are aware that it, it's like yeah. it's the idea it's like you can't have this because then you'll learn that word and you're going being like i know the word i know the word i just want the cd yeah, yeah it's like it's this like i get the whole like and back to the parenting thing i guess like i i get the whole like you don't necessarily want to just be saying cunt over and over again in front of a child because they might you know you want to be a positive influence around children but also like this is where I'm kind of off two minds because kids are going to learn this shit anyway. Kids yeah, are going to well, hear this stuff around the place. Why are you hiding this stuff from kids? Yeah, and I, I don't I don't ever, you know, want to get in the way of how people decide to parent their kids. That's up to them it, and yeah. whatever they want to do. Yeah. But, I mean, the, the reality for me is that at this point now, I know there's kids that I know when... I, I mean, I met them when they were actually kids, like in primary school. And I mean, a perfect Mm. example of this is I have a sister who's 10 years younger than me. When I started working in education, I was looking after my sister and I see her now. And it's very interesting how things have, I mean, how it's so different. The experience she had to the experience that me and my sister had and, uh, and Ellie rather like my other sister had. Yeah, Yeah. And like, it's very different the experience that we had compared to the experience she had, even in things like, I mean, we looked after her when we were, when I was 12, I looked after Claire yeah. by myself at home. But when Claire yeah, yeah, was yeah. 12, she had to go to after school care <laughs> and I looked yeah, after yeah. her at after school care. Like, and that that's just, that's just the way that the times change, you know, and uh, yeah, I don't yeah, blame yeah. my mum for anything with that, but that's just the way <laughs> no. things develop. But at yeah, the same yeah. time, like, there's, there, then there's the opposite side of that as well, where like, yeah, when I was a kid, it was like publicly being told, like, no, you can't have this because it's got swearing on it. Whereas now, it's like, you know, there's, it, there's songs that are played on popular radio that are like all yeah. about sex and like all, exactly. and not not well, just like about sex, <laughs> like pop songs in the 80s and 90s are about sex like overtly sexual activity well, is in the song like right know? now there's the what wap song like yeah, the yeah. fucking yeah that it's everywhere right now and people are losing their minds over it even though mm. songs like that as explicit as that have been released for forever and yeah it's, which but it's like and, but it, i mean i think the reality is like, like you said like kids are gonna hear it and they're gonna like it and I mean, yeah. the, and, and the other thing too, I remember a big thing in, in childcare. I remember it being like a talking point in childcare was when Anaconda by Nicki Minaj came out and yeah, kids yeah. loved it. 
just because it's like yeah. funny and it's talking about <laughs> bums. So kids were like, exactly. this, is, this is great. And obviously it's a catchy song, whatever. But like, yeah. obviously they don't understand what's actually the song is about. Exactly. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember childcare workers and the industry just like losing its mind about like how do we protect <laughs> children from anaconda by Nicki minaj and it was like but that's the i just remember sitting there thinking like who the fuck cares like what yeah, why exactly. does this like, matter it's like a kid but like most kids yeah like you said they're not going to clock that of what it's about they're just like oh this is funny and like most adults will hear pop songs and just be like oh cool fun catchy lyrics and not think anything deeper about yeah. what the song is about and it's just like kids won't fucking notice and if they do it's like ah oh, oh, oh no they learned what sex is yeah yeah they learned it from this and not from one of the other <laughs> four million things in society oh. that would teach them and this that's anyway it. like th- that kid can go on youtube that kid can go on fucking netflix that kid can look outside and we'll have some yeah. they'll find it somehow so yeah anyway. Well, yeah. and th- that's that's what I often think about in terms of a band like this, in that now, I mean, I- I'm sure bands are, you know, spreading these messages and saying these sorts of things in, in the current yeah. climate. Maybe I'm just not as aware of them, but like, <clears throat> it seems like now um, there is a real lack of this stuff, particularly in messaging like this, getting out publicly because... Well- it's not yeah, as tied like, to stuff like this, I suppose. And that's like, admittedly, I listen to fuck all music these days. So it's like, I don't really know what's out there. But like, there's definitely like, you know, there's there, uh, there's obviously like bigger politically kind of focused bands like, you know, Run the Jewels and shit like that. Like, mm. you know, Killer Mike is obviously very vocal and very active. Yeah. And so there are big artists out there doing it. And like my, my thinking goes towards hip hop because that's probably like, of what I do, the little of music that I do listen to is mostly hip hop. Um, and you know, there's, there, there are a lot of rappers out there trying to talk about shit and trying to bring up political things, but it's still not, but that's still like, that's over here. It's not everywhere. Yeah. And it's kind of like, yeah. And it's like, it doesn't feel as it's kind of crazy. And you know, there were obviously before this, there were, there were big, rock bands and whatnot out there that were like Pink Floyd and shit like that. And there were big bands out there that were, that did have messages that were appealing to a very wide audience, but it feels like, I don't know, this is probably me being a, an idiot, but it feels like Rage Against the Machine was the last huge band to be this political. Yeah. I mean, I, I would kind of agree in terms of the, the, the scope within, I know things, you know, like I, yeah, I would say that yeah. that's the last band that has like, I mean, filming a music video on the stock exchange and effectively shutting down Wall Street as part of exactly. just filming a music video. Like, yeah, totally. I don't know. I mean, I know bands <clears throat> uh, and artists are doing things like that all the time and I'm sure I'm just unaware of them. But like to the scale that I know, that's not happening anymore, you know? Like, yeah, yeah. And, and, and people, like they- people are, I guess, doing that in different manners or whatever. But at the same time, like... I mean, as as a kid, this just really helped inform so much of that, like, which would end up aligning very well to the message of punk and hardcore and stuff like that too. Which yeah, is, yeah, totally. Like, and I guess you know, for for Zach, his purposes, like, he came from that, so it it makes yeah, sense. Exactly. But yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, it's just it's interesting that that um. I don't know, it, it like it isn't as prevalent now or it isn't as obvious to me. Or maybe maybe it is happening, but it, it well, obviously it is happening, but it's just happening in a far more niche as you know, realm. Yeah. And that's um, it. And I think it's also there's probably a there's a saturation thing. It's like obviously back in the you know, when Rage were at their peak, there wasn't the internet well, the internet existed but not in the level that it is now. There wasn't Spotify, there wasn't like as mm. easy access so it's kind of like the big bands were ones that were kind of crafted and put in front of everybody like and so there was obviously a lot like you know rage i think did a really good job of retaining you know creative control and yeah retaining their message and what they were about like they didn't really compromise and if they did it wasn't in any like way that was kind of in, in opposition of what they were previously doing but 
they clearly had a fucking big team behind them that got them as big as they were. Like a band yeah. can't get that big on their on their own. <clears throat> and so they were clearly being pushed that way. And it's like, but now because there's just it's saturation, there's just there's like every every person and their dog can upload a song to Bandcamp or straight to Spotify now and put music out there. So there's probably a million and one people who are doing songs about Black Lives Matter or, you know, like, mm. you know, very political, th- the same kind of things that Rage would be doing if they were still going today. But because there's so many of them, there's obviously yeah. not enough teams behind every one to get them to the point that Rage is at kind of thing. So, well, yeah, yeah and it's I mean, kind of like, it's, it's out there, surely, but... I think, like, I don't know, I can't remember, <laughs> pe- some... And maybe it was Solo or Jay had a, someone was over here once and we put on some, some of those rage videos and like, mm. I mean, particularly the wall street one, like Michael Moore directed it and like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then there's other videos as well. And it, it, it's like, they had such high production value music videos well, that's... for, for like towards the end of the band for what is like often a band that's saying like, fuck you to the record label or fuck you to well, like everything. And they're just throwing is, money at them too. Like, yeah. This is something I, and I think this probably is why I feel a bit weird about Tom Morello as well, because like mm. there's this like, and I had this discussion with it with Ellie earlier is that it's like, it's funny that this is, this is a band that's very anti-establishment and very like, you know, they, they have a lot of problems with the capitalist system, but they very much operated within the capitalist system. Yeah. And as they got bigger, they had to, they kind of did things where I'm sure if I saw some of the stuff, like, as an example, like, even though Prophets of Rage should work for me because I fucking love Chuck D and I love <laughs> Be Real and mm. and then it's Rage Against the Machine, basically, it should work, but I do not like that band. And seeing them live and it just kind of, it just felt fake. Oh, yeah. And 100%. I think, and, and it's, I think that is a big part of because that because Prophets of Rage is very much Tom Morello being like I'm doing this now, and yeah. it's just like I don't know they're they're a weird band that like I think and I I have no idea I can't speak any like I don't have any facts behind this but I imagine that that probably had something to do with Rage ending and Zach leaving mm. because the band got to a point where it was too much in the system that they were clearly against. Yeah, and well, and I think I think that in all the stuff that I've read about it is that like they all just fought with each other when it was, but like yeah, yeah. the three of them that have remained playing together, th- mm. apparently were fighting as much with each other as with Zach. But I guess when it wasn't <laughs> in the scope of Rage, they were fine. Like I, I yeah, know that yeah, I know yeah. that one of the big like folklore stories about them is one of the things that like led to them breaking up was the bass player. F- doing the fuck around thing at the MTV Music Awards when Limp Biscuit oh, won the video yeah. for like best video and he like climbed yeah, up about, on the yeah. scaffolding and all this. Yeah. And apparently that was one of like the big things that like, that was like a big rift in the band because the band, I guess, were really like mad at him for doing that because they yeah, said yeah. to him like, we get what you're trying to do, but it doesn't represent the message we're trying to put across and he just did it anyway. And that sort of broke the band up but then he's continued on and played continued to play music with them for like yeah one, yeah <laughs> and obviously and that's, and that's what i f- why well, i feel like that that's what the the band kind of like the the three members that aren't zach kind of started to i don't know like again this is me just speculating but it seems like they were like more okay with compromising things and accepting the big band and like one of the things like I worked in music and I, you know, I enjoyed parts of it, but now I fucking hate the music industry and I'm really glad I'm not a part of it. Um, because there are, there's like, there's all this like fucking bullshit around. It's like, okay, you're a band that is that you know, you're, you're, you're edgy cause you're political. So people in record labels and, you know, management and all that will go, let's play into that. You should go climb that scaffolding because it makes you seem yeah. crazy and you're again, anti-establishment. It's like, fuck that. Like, it's just, I don't, yeah, it's it the whole thing so, it's it feels, against. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, and I, the way that it feels to me is that the rest of the band started kind of being like, okay with doing that kind of shit. Cause they're like, well, yeah, sure. we'll make the band bigger. And it's like, yeah, but that shit sucks. And then the fact that they all continued on and did, um, audio slave and now profits of rage and zach has 
disappeared, you know, aside from like small appearances here and there, he's out. And yeah. to me, that's just like, yeah, because you saw that the band was starting to go into yeah. a world that you didn't like. And so you fucking peeled out. And I'm like, yeah, I respect that. I like that a lot. Yeah, well, I think and one of the one of the things that's the biggest bummer for me is that like the only iteration of Rage Against the Machine I've ever seen is Prophets of Rage. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, which is which is disappointing because yeah, and that's it. Like it's just I remember when I when they first announced that that was that project was happening because I yeah like, like I said, and this is probably like you know people are gonna people have gotten mad about this. I don't give a shit about Soundgarden, never have. Sure, and. So when Audio Slave popped up, I'm like, great, they're with that cunt. I don't care. <laughs> and so, and then they released music and I'm like, I remember having this argument with a friend years and years ago where like, it would have been the first Audio Slave single. Mm. And he's just like, listen to the music, man. It's just Rage, but it's got Chris Cornell on it. I'm like, yeah, but it sucks. It's just like, yeah, and it's not I don't rage. know. I can't. It's like, it's the rock chorus stretched yeah. out for a record <laughs> like exactly yeah and it's just it just didn't work for me so i was just really bitter about that and so then when i heard the prophets of rage was happening i was like maybe this is it maybe this all kind of because they i'm guessing that happened oh, clearly they were friends with with be real and, and and chuck d but like maybe that happened because they were kind of like oh audio slave didn't work because we didn't have rapping on it we need to get rapping back on it <laughs> and it's like yeah. yeah but it's still yeah but it's, it does not fucking work and yeah, it's I mean, just yeah, it it's a sight to behold seeing prophets of rage. I have to say, yeah, I'm glad that I saw yeah. them after having been drinking for like 24 hours straight. <laughs> it made it far well, more manageable and for I, me. That was also at a point where I like was working in an industry I didn't like, and I was at a festival that I'd been at forever. Mm. And then they came on, so I was already I was not in the right headspace <laughs> to be watching prophets of rage, but I was already just like I just want to fucking go home. Yeah. I don't want to deal with this shit. <laughs> And so, well, yeah, you know, it's unfortunate that, that that they didn't turn that experience around for you. <laughs> that they sold yeah, it. seriously, yeah. And it's like I guess like I because I've been you know reading stuff that um that like Tom Morello because obviously Tom Morello has become very vocal. Like, well, he never really stopped, but he's I guess with Twitter and stuff like that. Yeah, he, what he says is a bit more obvious for me now. I'm I'm seeing it more than I was for a while, and. He still says some shit that I very much agree with and he's still doing mm. things that I very much agree with and I like it, but there's still something... Maybe it's the fact he was in fucking Iron Man. Like, he's in a Marvel movie. It's like, why are you in a fucking Marvel movie, man? Yeah. What are you doing? You're I, part of it's just Disney, like, bro. Yeah. And then, like, having said this, I love the Marvel movies, <laughs> but... But still, I'm just like, you're better than this. I, I, I like this band because you're all supposed to be better than me. Yeah. And now you're saying, and now you're proving you're not. <laughs> so it's me like, paying for my yeah. Disney Plus subscription, <laughs> you shouldn't be in there. Exactly. Yeah. This is this is a different world. That's my that's my that's my Disney Plus world, and then I have my like you know my Rage Against the Machine world over here. You exist over there. You should but, be uh, telling anyway, me not like, to subscribe to Disney Plus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so it's kind of like you know um my point being is just like he clearly is i like he and i are probably like still quite aligned politically i guess and like i should there are p people out there other other people out there that will be saying things similar to him where i'm like fuck yeah you're the best i like you mm. but with him i don't know it's just there's some sour about him I, I feel like i've talked about how much i dislike tom morello a lot in this episode <laughs> sorry tom if you're listening um <laughs> sign me up for your master class <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, all right, but, uh, well, let's anyway. uh, let's pack it in on, uh, yeah. on the, the Tom Morello hate. But um, <laughs> yeah. I guess the... I suppose it's a, like an interesting thing to talk... Uh, well, it's sort of strange thing to talk about in the scope of everything that's been going on. But um, I think when we first... The first time we did this together, obviously back yeah. then, it was predominantly talking about what people did and how they did it with music yeah. and things like that. Yeah. Um, but obviously, and then yeah, as you've highlighted, spent a long time working in the music industry and then getting out yep. of it due to being, you know, obviously burnt out from it, but yep. you are still actively doing that stuff from time to time. Well, that's, yeah. Like I'm kind of, I don't know. I was like, liked music. Like I, mm. kind of, I don't listen to as much music as I used to because I still, I very much like I left the music industry a year ago. Yeah. And so I'm still burnt out by it. But, um, 
and I, you know, I'm listening to more music now than I was for a while. But anyway, that's beside the point. Um, it's, I, it's an industry that I don't want to be part of. Having said that, I have a lot of good friends that are a part of it, and that's something that they like you as one of them. Yeah, like you're you play you're a musician, you play in bands, you tour, you do all that kind of stuff, and it's something that you care about. And I obviously care about my friends, and there is an artistic side of things that like I do have an artistic output that I like that it works with music. Yeah, and I'm trying to become more of like I'm trying well I, I'm trying to do more like art for art's sake and like personal stuff and stuff like that. But I do still enjoy doing you know album covers and whatnot from time to time, and so I still am. I, I, I will spit, all, I will say all over Twitter and I'll say all sorts of shit about how much I hate the music industry, but I'm still affiliated with it. <laughs> That's okay. Well, you know, <laughs> at least, at least uh, you're not in a Marvel movie, put it that way. <laughs> but I'm <laughs> sure I, if they I came asking, <laughs> you'd be there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, yeah. thank you for talking with me about that record. No worries. Yeah, I think we talked maybe a little, like forty percent about the record, and then sixty percent about other shit. But anyway, that's fine. Um, but yeah, but it fucking rules. And something that I even because I guess I've been a, a, a you know a person with not a very good sound system my entire life. Um, this I was just like, yeah, the record sounds cool. Like my my the, I guess the most I ever listened to this record would have been on a discman. Yeah. And then, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then I was listening to st- stuff this week where they were just like, this is a record where you, if you have a good sound system, like, like isolate yourself, turn it up really loud. It's a fucking amazing sounding record. And it really is. It's a really good sounding record. And yeah. I, I mean, like, I, 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 I definitely, I definitely did that this week and I forgot. Yeah. And again, yeah, I guess because I listened, I would have listened to it in on a scratch CD walking home yeah. or in my bedroom on whatever cheap CD player my mum bought for me, you know, like, yeah, but yeah, listening exactly. to it now, it's like, oh wait, this sounds great. <laughs> like, well, that's it. Like I, 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 <laughs> with this, like I, I say that I've probably listened to this record more than I've listened to anything else because I discovered in, it would have been year 11 that the length of this CD, it's like 56 minutes or something like that long was the exact length of me walking out the front door getting two buses and then walking into school so i listened to it every single day on the way and on the way back every single day yeah over and over and over again that's the only thing i listened to because i just figured out that it it worked so i was like yep this is great this is this is what i listen to when i go to and from school and so that was just on a discman in my pocket with really shitty little earbuds and but that was and I remember, like, I have, like, very distinct memories of sitting on the bus and, like, listening really closely and being, like, this part is amazing because it sounds like this. Because, like, there's things like Township Rebellion and stuff like that, which is, like, a, I guess one of the weirder songs on the record. Mm. We didn't really talk about individual songs on this record, but that song sounds fucking awesome. Yeah. No. Well, this week, because I, I have, like, good headphones for, because I work in, like, videography now. And so I have, like, good sounding headphones for doing sound stuff at work. So I've just sat at work with them, like, sucked mm. my head listening to this record all week and it's yeah it's just like oh this movie like this movie this album sounds fantastic like it's still like an album from 92 still sounds perfect yeah and i mean i think that probably has that probably lends to the fact that they were on like a massive record label that would have put totally. it into it but i mean that being yeah. said as well like the band really leaned into the you know not you know we played everything not using samples all that sort of stuff but like it's it sounds fucking unreal you know yeah and that's why like and i guess that's yeah that is a testament like because there's i've seen people posting on twitter recently like a mutual friend of ours taylor who retweeted something or something like that it was just like talking about like replacing drum sounds on records and it's just like Mm. oh it's just it's it's shitty and it's like yeah that's this band is just like they had that statement on every record being like this didn't include synthesizers they played all yeah. the record or all the instruments and shit like that and it's it yeah and that's why it holds up like you listen to these records now like i listened i listened like when you asked me to be on this and i was like cool i'm gonna do rage against the machine i listened to self-titled and then i just went straight into evil empire and then i just went straight into battle of los angeles and it's yeah. just like these rec- all three records just like survive and they still work and they still sound and especially like with the political climate right now they are still super fucking current and they you could put this record like you could show someone this record now and it could like they could go oh yeah that came out a week ago like it, it all yeah. works because it's well, real instruments yeah, and <laughs> all, all their songs started getting a real fucking run at it again in the last couple of months like i mentioned it yeah. being on the footy and stuff like it's yeah exactly they've all they've kicked back off again because of it for sure yeah Absolutely, yeah. It's just, and it's, yeah, there's, it, because it's, 
it's real sounding and they've just managed to hit this like they were just before new metal so they weren't like playing a kind of a, a flash in the pan style of music that you know mm. obviously new metals had a bit of a resurgence but <laughs> they weren't they didn't play something that was just like you know uh you know something that was just a trend they weren't doing that they were just playing something that was kind of original that informed a lot of other artists and it just it it's continued it works it still it still sounds relevant yeah well but, uh, if anyone anyway, hasn't yeah. heard this record go and listen to <laughs> the record we I, we talked about for 40 to 50 percent of this yep. conversation <laughs> yeah anyway sick thanks for doing it no worries thank you very much <laughs>